Welcome to episode 17 of season 5 of the Gateway Geeks podcast. This episode, I will be taking a deep dive into rape revenge films. We would like to take a moment to share with our listeners a very direct content warning. This episode will be focusing on acts of sexual violence and revenge. If this sort of topic is in any way uncomfortable for you, we ask that you know your limitations and not listen if it will have any sort of negative impact on you. Please take care of yourselves and each other. Now to your host, Tracy, Sarah, Chris, and Joe. All right, Joe, you want to introduce the show? Yeah. Hi, everybody. This is uh, Season 5, Episode 17 of the Gateway Geeks Podcast. Uh, we're going to name this episode something. Shall we just call it Rape Revenge Films, Tracy? Do you think that's too on the nose? I think that works. Okay. <laughs> so I'm going to introduce this episode's host, I should say, Tracy Gomillion, who will be talking about Rape Revenge in film. And Tracy, okay, you guys, hi, if, I'm, I'm Tracy, and I will pass the mic to introduce uh, Sarah Jane Connor. Hello, I'm Sarah Jane Connor, and I guess Chris is last. As always, as intended, I'm Chris, and I'm last. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well, so uh, to be totally transparent, I hope that we can have a conversation as we're going throughout this. Um, I think I'm going to be talking about a lot of films that y'all have seen, so definitely interested in y'all's take on them, because um, it could surely be different than mine. Otherwise, this could just be downright depressing, which is not the goal. Um, <laughs> and with that, uh, the topic Keep that it I will light. be Have a good time. <laughs> exactly, yeah. right? Yeah. As light as can be, I will do. So uh, Just have so fun with it. Yeah, just as much fun as there is when discussing <laughs> the topic of rape and how it's portrayed in film. Yeah, so we're going to be talking about rape revenge films and kind of exploring the ideas whether or not these films are empowering to those who have experienced rape or exploiting them. Um, so with that being said, first thing I want to just say to anyone who is listening to this episode, here is a serious content warning. Um, I am going to be talking about rape. I'm going to be talking about torture. I'm going to be talking about vengeance that involves violence and killing and maiming and mutilation of genitals and things of such nature. So if that is not something that for whatever reason you are comfortable with listening to, this is not the episode for you. So we appreciate you listening, but go ahead and tune out now. It's certainly not safe for children to listen to. I would not recommend a child listen to this particular episode. So I don't or think a child any should of listen the ones to any before. episode of our yeah, podcast. No. <laughs> I was going to say that's totally our brand, telling people not to listen to our podcast. That's definitely. Yeah, like no kids and no parents who share our last names. <laughs> right. <laughs> Indeed, indeed. Yeah, I think because I work with kids, I just feel always like hyper aware of children being in oh, for involved. Sure. Yeah. So, so let's get started. So, um, what is a rape revenge film? So, most rape revenge films contain a very clear arc that involves someone being raped. Um, that individual experiences some type of transformation. Sometimes it's a proxy who experiences the transformation after someone else is raped, someone who they love and care about. And then subsequently, there are acts of vengeance that occur to rapists. Sometimes that is the rapist who committed the original rape. Sometimes it is other rapists um, or would be rapists. So there's a lot going on there. Um, we've got Rosario Dawson um, showing here. We're going to talk about her um, epic rape revenge film, Descent, which very few people seem to know about, um, probably because it is absolutely horrifying. So, um, but we will discuss that later. So moving on. So some history about the subgenre of rape revenge. So rape, as we all know, has always been uh, used as a device in film, whether that be for better or worse. Uh, the very first film that, to my knowledge, that was really launching this as an actual genre was The Virgin Spring in 1960, and we will be discussing that film. And the first film that really gave greater um, interest or discuss levels with the genre was I Spit on Your Grave in 1978. Uh, there are films in this realm that consider themselves to be 
horror, exploitation, drama, psychological thriller. Um, lots of folks don't want to use the term rape revenge to, you know, in the title or how they describe their films for obvious reasons. Um, and to be very clear that lots of things have changed over time within the subgenre, um, where we do see a trend at this point, which is offering the survivor greater autonomy and exacting revenge for themselves. Um, however, some critics, um, specifically feminist critics, will typically still say it's too little too late. Um, there are still those who say that this is very empowering genre of film to those who are survivors of rape. Gracie, can I ask you, I think you said in a previous discussion that uh, like Birth of a Nation falls huh? into this genre, doesn't it? Oh, can you huh? not hear me? Hang on, hang on. No, I'm trying to fix what I'm doing. It's going too fast. Oh. I just like, it's okay. What was you saying? I was saying, did you consider Birth of a Nation to be a rape revenge film? Because I thought we were talking about that at one point. I think it has, oh, sorry. Yeah. No, I think it has it has pieces that are absolutely like fit into this. I would say that like the overall messaging of that film was much more on a racial tone than the rape revenge. Mm -hmm. Um I think that rape revenge played a role, but mm -hmm. I don't think I would call it a rape revenge film. Because it doesn't have like the other characteristics that you're talking about. Right. What were we okay. gonna say, Chris? Yeah. Well, it, yeah, it also lacks. Am I muted? No, no you're, you're not. You're on. Oh, okay, sorry. For some reason, it's not showing me when I'm talking. Um, yeah, it also lacks that that inherent. Um, um, as Tracy will probably get into that uh, uh, illusion of uh, feminine empowerment via violence, like that's uh, you know revenge against black people as opposed to uh, you know. <laughs> I will yeah. I will own my feminist fury through masculinized violence. Right. Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah, it's it's clearly the it's used as a plot device to uh get vengeance for very different reasons it seems. So. Yeah. Um but you could definitely say it's got characteristics. Mm -hmm. Um So, The Virgin Spring. Um I have not seen this film just full uh disclosure in like 10 years but i have seen it um so came out in 1960 um directed by ingmar bergman and this this tale is actually based on a 13th century swedish ballad okay so this whole concept of rape revenge is as old as time right as long mm -hmm. as there have been people around some people have been doing deviant acts and harming each other and uh, raping one another. And so it's no surprise that the idea of getting revenge for such acts has been around as long as time. And so essentially this tale is of a young girl traveling through the woods who comes across a group of like, I don't know, lack, for lack of a better word, just like traveling men who are looking for work or something of this nature. And they not only all rape her but they kill her as well so um the father becomes aware of who these individuals are and then kills all of those men who raped and killed his daughter um is definitely an intense film um and it's it's really uh it's like it's a very beautifully shot like the cinematography is like very lovely um the the rapist are like sort of like overly portrayed as like gross nasty ugly dirty bad um just to drive yeah, that home there's a bit of uh aroma coating mm -hmm. yeah like, don't get me, it, it's actually like she said it's a, actually a gorgeous film but like i don't know yeah it, i saw it when i was very young and there's definitely some uh um subtext that was like, lost on me at the time. Visa no, I would mean. agree. It does come across as like these people, 
right? I'm doing air quotes mm-hmm. right now. These people are bad people who did a bad thing and deserve to die. So I think it falls a little bit more into that, you know, birth of a nation category to a degree that there could have been other reasoning to lead this guy to feel like uh, that he, it was well within his rights for justice of his daughter to kill them, um, to take that into his own hands. Um, so one of the big things is that even though there were calls um, by some to say that this was like lewd or inappropriate, this won an Academy Award for the best foreign language film in the year 1960. Mm. So that's like a big difference that we'll see compared to most of the other films that I'm going to talk about. So um, definitely interesting. This is also notably one of the only like foreign films that I included, mostly just because it's like outside of the realm of my um, understanding and knowledge to do a deep dive into films from lots of other um nations and languages um that i'm just not as familiar with so oh yeah the dutch are an amazingly deep well in this topic uh-huh. and i'm not just talking about paul verhoven for once <laughs> absolutely so one thing that's very notable here is that what we see in really early rape revenge films is that the female is the victim right and so and here you can see her portrayed she's fair she's lovely she's beautiful she's all of these you know shining examples of purity uh she's very symbolic in this way and because she is murdered um she has no transformation she doesn't change she doesn't get to take back any power in the situation it's all reliant on the father to do that on her behalf. So we don't see any of that transformation in the female character. Then taking a big leap, you know, 18 plus years later, I spit on your grave. This very famous uh, movie poster cover of a woman's backside with torn clothes and scratched body. So I have no idea how to say this director's name, Meyer Zarchi, I have no idea. Um, So Rob, Roger Ebert uh, notably called it a vile bag of garbage upon seeing this film. Damn. So uh, I thought that was worth it. Yeah, I thought that was (laughs) worth including. I, this is another film that I have not seen in over 10 years. I do remember having like a very visceral reaction upon seeing this film and not feeling like I ever needed to watch it again. Uh, One of Rob Zombie's favorite movies. Yeah, that's not surprising at all. Which is Um, so weird, Tracy, because you like some of his other movies that do not involve so it's not yes. just yeah. you can see elements of this film and stuff that Rob Zombie does, like with some of the way that things are shot and things like that. Yeah. But essentially, the uh, the young woman um, goes to write a book um, and she is like living in a pretty remote area. She is having her groceries delivered by a young man who has some sort of like intellectual disability, but he shares with the guys who work at the grocery store. I saw her breast. She's amazing looking. Oh my goodness. Um, so the rest of these guys start to like hang around, get the idea of like, Hey, we can basically help our intellectually, uh, you know, disabled friend lose his virginity with this woman. Um, and then proceed to gang rape her in a very uh, prolonged uh, violent scene. Um, Notably, initially, uh, the young man who's supposed to be losing his virginity initially like balks at the idea and is not into it, um, but eventually does, uh, does indeed rape her. Uh, He lies to the rest of the guys and says that he kills her right? Um, Because they say like she, you know, she can't continue to live, right? Like she's a witness to what we've done to her. He puts some of her blood from the attack on her on a knife, shows it to the other guy, said I killed her. Um, Obviously she's not dead. So she is someone who we see go through this transformation of, okay, I'm going to get my bearings. They also destroy her manuscript, which is like the whole point of like the setup of this film is that she's writing this manuscript. They destroy that. so 
she decides to get her revenge on each of these rapists in very unique, different ways. Um, with one individual, she does uh, remove his genitals violently. Um, so I would say that that's definitely present. Uh, there was a lot of censorship of this film whenever it first came out, um, like a whole, whole lot. Um, and it wasn't until many years later, basically with VHS phenomenon, that like the, this was a movie that got like passed around and they started to see like big numbers that way, which led it to some sort of like cult classic status. Um, and I think that the most notable line from the film is whenever uh, the, the woman who's at the center of it all repeats a line that was said to her during her attack um, as she is killing another uh, one of her rapists, which was suck it, bitch. Um, so it was literally reclaiming language, right? Mm -hmm. And and using that language against her perpetrator while then lodging an ax in his back. So um, very violent film. Um, the minute I saw the file name, I'm like, oh man, we're gonna have to deal with spit on your grave. <laughs> oh boy. So yeah, exactly. I mean, Tracy, I feel like I know the answer to this already, but so uh, this movie poster is clearly like sexual, uh, what's, what's the right word? I guess sexualizing sexual violence, right? Uh, do, do you see the same thing with like the shots, like trying to, I don't know what the right word would be, like romanticize the sexual violence within the film? So this, this individual, this woman in the film does essentially use her sexuality to gain access to each of the rapists again, mm. to then have them in a vulnerable position so that she can then kill them. Mm -hmm. So that's something that I think a lot of like feminist scholars and film scholars take issue with is this idea of, is that really empowerment? to so then if you've been sexually assaulted to then take your sexuality and turn the table and to use that as your entryway to ex exact your vengeance. Um, I don't claim to know the answer to that. Um, I've just not, I've think, not seen it. So that's why I was asking. Mm -hmm. No, I mean, like she, she definitely does use like her, her level of like attractiveness and all of these other things as, as means to exact her revenge. Absolutely. Well, I think he's talking about the cinematography. He's asking if it's grindcore porn and the answer yeah. is yes. Yeah. That's definitely right. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah it is i think that that's why it's a cult classic i think that that's why it has that status now oh um, yeah no when i saw it you know literally vhs that gets handed to people and like this is, movie was too fucked up for theaters mm -hmm. you can yeah. only see it. it it was basically the ring oh yeah for like oh yeah. man you gotta watch this and you watch it and then you have to pretend like you're cool enough to have liked it <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, no, this is fucked up. Someone else better watch this. Get it away from me. Right, exactly. That's the only way you get rid of it is to make sure someone else watches it. it yeah, I think that that's kind of how this got spread. So th something to definitely include is that because of like the, the popularity later, it's been remade, I think on multiple occasions. And there are lots of like follow-up films that have I Spit on Your Grave in the title. I have not found it necessary myself to view any of these films and I will not be viewing any of these films. I can take a gander as to like what they're all about. Um, but I would say that this one is definitely more on the exploitation side of things um, and definitely does come across more like you were saying, Chris, like that it is more pornographic in its betrayal of, of rape, um, which is obviously a concern, right? With this genre, so. There you go. All right, moving on. Keeping it light, light and friendly. All right. <laughs> Just so, breezy. Oh, yeah, it's super breezy. So <laughs> I think it's important to talk about who is who is getting revenge in these films because this this really is at the heart of the matter. So we've already talked about in um, Virgin Spring, right, where we've got some films utilize a male, especially like a father figure, as the vengeance seeker on the survivor's behalf. We also have like a whole cadre of films that will employ a female friend to enact revenge on their uh, friend's behalf. A lot of times the reason that this friend is acting out 
is because the other friend is either missing, has died by suicide, um, or they're they're not necessarily well enough to take out the revenge on themselves. So that is the individual who has the transformation following the learning about the rape of their friend. It is less common within this genre to have the survivor themselves take that lead role in in taking the vengeance. However, we see more and more of that in like the past 15 years. And I think that that's definitely the direction it's it's going uh, for the most part. There's still a lot of the female friends um, showing up in films. Um, so why does this matter? I think it matters for a whole lot of reasons. I think definitely the whole idea of if you've got a female who's been victimized and a male father figure, um, stepping in and taking control and being the, the violent actor. Um, first of all, like, that's just, that's just basic. Like, that's just like a, yeah. a basic overdone thing. Um, and, uh, there's nothing very, um, interesting about that. And it really minimizes that individual's story. Um, and it minimizes their voice and choice in the matter. Um, I think there's a lot to be said for the whole female friend idea. I think it's interesting. Um, I think it speaks to this idea of um, how deep friendship can be and how people really, how rape really does have a great impact, not on just the person raped, but on those who are their loved ones and not necessarily just their family, but also their friends. Um, and then whenever it is the individual themselves, a lot of times I feel like uh, critics will be very hard on a survivor whose transformation isn't like really positive. Even though it's a revenge seeking transformation, they'll still point like punch a lot of holes in things. Like if that individual does, for instance, like say, like we talked about before, use their sexuality or like sort of feminine wiles or beauty in any way to um, play a role um, in how they conduct their revenge. Um, also, I feel like they'll get kicked around by the critics if they have any sort of like self-destructive behaviors following the rape, uh, which is incredibly common for rape survivors to um, struggle to cope with a rape um, and to, you know, indulge in some coping methods that are perhaps not the most healthy option available because uh, people don't like talking about rape and it's really hard to get good help after one has been raped. And we're going to talk more about that because why does this genre even exist except for the fact that people don't trust that police can handle this? Right? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, the original like, Mortimer, you know, the original version is like if you need a heroic story where you want your male character to have the audience's permission to do some real fucked up shit. Yep. Old boy. Oh yeah. yeah. Old yeah. boy. And I mean, hell, you can go all the way back to the story of Odysseus who went out for milk disappeared for 30 years came <laughs> back and killed every dude his wife talked to while he was gone yeah, yeah. it's like yeah. hey 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 i wasn't actually dead i still had dibs you all die now and as an audience member you're supposed to go yeah good for you man fuck those guys yeah <laughs> now as standards of you know what oh you know what constitutes violence against your your wife property change you have that evolution yeah you know the original, you know, the, the next step after that was like, if you really want to give someone permission to get real fucked up in his revenge seeking, you know, they killed your father. Yeah. Oh, oh you struck it. You struck it. The pat. Oh no, you know everything from uh, you know Hamlet to Simba. Like, no, I have yeah. all the justification to like just kill you and burn your shit to the ground now. Yeah, and and, and then. And like the super fucked up thing in Greek mythology and Greek culture was if you notice in the Odyssey, the suitors invade Odysseus's house, which is equally as big of a deal as them just like kidnapping his wife, basically. Because yeah. Yeah. There's, there's that idea of uh, there's like the ecos and the domos. And so like the domos is your house and the ecos is like, yeah. so the domos is the feminine the ecos is the masculine realm so you can see the parallels there but it's a pretty fucked up like 
conflation. <laughs> okay, yeah, but that's exactly where I was going to next. Where then, yeah. as the as the the scope of these stories shrinks from people who control countries down to the individual, as stories of normal people become more involved yeah it's that invasion of the home that invasion of the domicile and what is the ultimate invasion of a man's life it's violence against his wife Mm -hmm. and specifically it can't just be murder it's the rape which Mm -hmm. is far more insulting to the man's ego than even the murder is and after that point well you know all bets are off the God said, I can, you know, kill your kids, burn your house down, whatever I need to do. Yeah. Yep. 100%. Okay. Keeping it light, folks. We're moving on to the next <laughs> slide. Do you just, it, it, incidentally, do you hear a cat screaming in the background, Sarah and Chris? Yes. Can you guys hear that? Bit. I no? can do. No, okay. I can't that's, hear it. <laughs> that's good. Okay. Just asking. No reason. <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. Okay, so uh, nice, nice discourse on this. Moving forward, um, let's just talk about the nitty gritty. How gritty of a rape scene is really required? So this is this is a point that lots of scholars and film critics will bring up. Um, most films in this genre do show a rape scene or strongly hint around a rape scene very early in the film. Some do forego this scene altogether, um, but that is, I think, the exception and not the rule. Um, in many cases, that rape scene is prolonged, it is extremely violent, and oftentimes involves elements of torture. And I think that uh, there's a lot of different ideas surrounding why this is. I can hear the cat, Jeff. Can you get the cat? To shut I can. Up? I can now hear the cat. <laughs> He's. We gave him a bunch of. Sorry, Tracy. We gave him a bunch of. Uh, we call it Pugu because he gets constipated. So he's taking his weekly shit. I think is what it is. It's kind of like give it a minute. Yeah, no, I get. That's what I would sound like too. So. <laughs> Good job, Trogdor. Good job, Come on, buddy. Everyone oh, has to tell Trogdor good job. Good job, buddy. Good job, buddy. Uh, <laughs> good job. Now go Way on. to take a crap. Way to take a crap. All Two right. Two pounds lighter. Good job. He wants everyone to know. <laughs> All right. I'll, I'll, so, let you, I'll let you decide if we edit that out later, Tracy. That'll be up to you. I'll put a note. <laughs> it doesn't matter to me. No. So I just, it just totally threw me off my thought when I could <laughs> hear sorry. him howling. I'm sorry. It's fine. No, it's, it's our cat. Um, so <laughs> a majority of the criticism of this whole genre is really related to how the rape is portrayed. Right. Cause that's where a lot of people say, this is just fucking exploitation. And potentially this is pornographic. Some people are getting off on this rape scene. Right. Um, And so it does beg the question, at least for me, of how much the audience needs to literally see in order to feel that the revenge is justified. Because we can show a hinting scene, right, where everyone can infer that a rape is either about to occur or has just occurred without seeing any actual violence, right? Um, however, I think that leaves for some people maybe room to doubt the veracity of the claims of rape or lack the, uh, the feeling of this person's story is worthwhile to watch for the next two hours, to watch them have this major transformation and go on this vigilante streak against the rapist. So... People certainly debate this a lot. I found a very interesting quote from this guy, David Andrews, from his very long titled article called Reconsidering the Body Genre, Rape Revenge and Post-Feminism Softcore as Biocultural Phenomenon, in which he states, rape revenge is both controversial and feminist in part because it exploits images of rape even as it moralizes over them. 
telling a feminist story. Sexual violence in this genre emphasizes ugliness, pain, and realism, yet its victim can be presented in a sexually alluring manner. It does, yeah, it all comes down to lensing, right? It all comes down to, yeah. are you? what are you trying to say? Are you trying to make the audience also feel helpless? Um, in general, you know, my feeling would be, ah, you know, maybe not wholly necessary. I don't want to say never. I don't want to say it's never been done well. It can also be done metaphorically. I mean, arguably, like my favorite example of this genre, which involves only a metaphorical you know, rate, but then a literal murder attempt is uh, Batman Returns. Mm. Oh, yeah. Can you tell the example? Because I'm missing it. I'm not remembering from Batman Returns. Oh, uh, Michelle Pfeiffer is a, a, a Catwoman. She's uh, uh, assaulted in her apartment by um, uh, Christopher Walken. Who it's, a, it's a very tense sexualized scene, but then he just pushes her out a window. And she lands in the trash and gets licked by a bunch of cats and becomes Catwoman. Look, it, it, it makes sense in the movie, more or less. But it's... Uh, <laughs> You know, it's it's Gotham. Like, what else are you going to do after you get pushed out a window? Right. True. Okay. But then, yeah, it's 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 her sense of like, okay, I've been fucked over. I've been, you know, there's a little bit of an insinuation that she uh, like got maybe got infected by by cats biting her as she laid in the trash. But you know, <laughs> it's mostly a uh, I'm owning this moment. And then it, it does lead to uh, her confrontation with Christopher Walken late in the film, featuring my favorite Christopher Walken line of dialogue as he is uh, being, she's got the whip going, he's backing up back towards a window and he's just like, I can give you whatever you want. Money, power, really big saucer of milk. That's incredible. <laughs> oh man, that makes me want to watch that again, Tracy. Uh, I, lo- I love oh, that God. movie. It's been so long since I've seen Batman Returns. Oh my God, I know, me too. Tracy, I looked up uh, David Andrews on uh, Google Scholar, and he so he uh, it's he does porn studies apparently. Mm-hmm. So that's like yeah. his that's like his expertise area. I wasn't sure if it was like I wasn't sure what it was exactly. Yeah, no, I read I read through a couple of things, but this one seemed to fit best. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right. Okay, so moving along, I am going to need to take like a very slight break to get like a little bit more whiskey to make it through this, but I will. I will <laughs> fair. You got it. <laughs> totally fair. All right. Kill Bill Volume 1, 2003, directed by Quentin Tarantino, as we all know. So, um... I am like a notorious like uh, crit- critic of the whole series of Kill Bills for a lot of reasons. I do like them. I think there's a lot of great stuff that happens in them, um, but I am still critical of lots of aspects of it. Um, so in this, in this first of the trilogy, we see Uma Thurman. She is the survivor and vigilante. So after... Um, after being shot she's in a coma where a nurse not only rapes her himself but also sells her bodies to her body to others as like a rape object basically for years um because i believe it's four years that she's in the coma um so while this scene in the film is really not the focus of the film and it's not and it's not even a main motivation for the other like vengeance plots. It does pack like a very clear punch and sort of set the stage for like what Uma Thurman is capable of and like how seriously empowered she is to take action on her own behalf. Um, so in this scene, um, the guy in the hat um is basically given access to her body for 75 dollars and she wakes up out of the coma as he is about to rape her and she basically like i i don't know if this is the right way to use this word like eviscerates him like like chews through his neck and like he bleeds out 
Um, and, uh, you know, so she kills him and, you know, is preventing this rape from occurring. And she then tries to stand up to what she realizes her legs no longer work. She's been comatose for four years. Her muscles have atrophied to the point of no longer being able to hold up her own weight. Um, and she, you know, quick thinking, you know, person that she is finds, a. uh, uh a switchblade on this guy um takes that to be able to you know prepare for whatever's coming next right and then when the nurse returns you know obviously he's shocked at seeing this she does a very nice you know slicing of the achilles heel drops him and then she has like many rape survivors a flashback Whenever she's looking, looking at him, she's already smashed his head in the door a couple times, just yelling, where's Bill? Because, you know, she's already a, like a person on a mission with a, a vision of vengeance. Um, but she looks down at his hands and she looks down at his uh, name tag, sees the name tag say Buck, sees Buck written across his, his knuckles in a tattoo, and she has a flashback of him the first time he approached her to rape her and then becomes even more incensed and then proceeds to kill him saying what he had said to her again using his language against him your name is buck right and you like to fuck right as she's slamming his head in between a door and a door jam finally killing him so um i think that it's an under uh, estimated scene in the film. You know, I don't think it gets a lot of like notice because there's so many other like wild, fantastical things that happen in the Kill Bill world. Um, but I think it's interesting that it was included, right? Um, and I think that, uh, that, you know, I can speculate lots of reasons as to why a storyline like this was included. Um, but it's uh, it sets the stage for her to be known as like a badass not to be fucked with who is in charge and will take vengeance at, you know, show no mercy to those who have who have crossed her and and her body. Right. Um, worth mentioning, in my opinion, is that this was a Harvey Weinstein production and Thurman later alleged that he sexually abused her. So while, you know, and, and, and that's, that's real world stuff, right? We're talking about a film with some fictional characters, but then we got some real world stuff going on. Um, and the idea of what is justice when, you know, again, another, uh, man who has power and control in her life, right? Uh, sexually violates her what is her her opportunity to act on that so um, and sort of very famously it was not until she made those allegations that the production company even released the footage of her wrecking the car where she was injured on the filming of this film which she had requested beforehand to you know get some I assume compensation for, you know, she had asked for a stunt double and was denied and was harmed and had lots of issues with Quentin Tarantino in the years, you know, following this. So lots to unpack with Kill Bill. Yep. <laughs> yeah. <sighs> Tarantino, what he's trying to do throughout the movie is not make her look invincible. Because he's pulling, one, a lot from Grindhouse films, which is, you know, a real love of his. And he's, he's trying to work up towards the crescendo at the end where it becomes a, a kung fu film and she becomes an unstoppable machine of death. So he's trying to... Um, it's almost less a... a Okay, this is the, uh, can Chris go an entire episode without referencing Dragon Ball Z for some reason? 
<laughs> I love almost... that this is a running thing. <laughs> I know. I wouldn't I actually have expected that, but it is. He's almost <laughs> trying to establish her character development via her power development. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because this is interesting. Interesting. Yeah, I guess interesting would be the way to put it in this conversation. Because, and this is one of the rare examples where you're not trying to establish justification mm-hmm. for the mission. Yeah. Because she's already on the mission. And also, it's also well established that she is a murderous piece of shit. Mm-hmm. You know, um, um, oh, who is it? The guy who gets the line, well, we deserve to die for what we did to her. She deserves to die too. So I guess we'll see how it plays out. <laughs> the uh yeah well and like aren't most of the people that she ends up killing like the major characters not like the buck who likes to fuck guy but like aren't all of bill's whatever assassins aren't most of them women all but one yeah yeah right mm-hmm. so so she's killing a lot of women too um, yeah so yeah. he's using rape here not as the example of the violation that motivates but rather as the uh, the nadir of her power, her mm-hmm. uh, her physical mm-hmm. low point, yeah. where she has no ability to uh, you know, you know, inflict violence on the world, which is the only uh, way that her character interacts with the world. Right, and then by the yep. end of by the end of the second volume, she's got like the the Bruce Lee jumpsuit, and she's gone all the way up the Enter the Dragon. Tower. That's the first movie. Is that the first movie? Oh wow, yeah, you're right. No, he kills Lucy Lee at the end of the first movie. That's, that's right. Because it's, it's, the second movie is very different. Yeah, and yeah. The, the, the thing, all, every act of both of these movies changes genres in a very, mm-hmm. very specific way. And he does it. That's always the thing. Like, God damn it, Tarantino. There's, there's no one better at doing what Tarantino does. But he's also undeniably like oh, kind of a piece of shit. So yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. No, I think it's I think this is like a one of the reasons why I chose to include this is that I think that it is something that I feel like a lot of rape survivors saw this scene and were like, WTF. Okay. And I say that for the following reasons. I think it's very clear that this was written and directed and everything by a man from the fucking get go. Because, yep, what message comes across here is that even a woman who's coming out of a coma should be able to fight, attack, stop, prevent, and kill her attacker before the rape occurs. Right. Yeah. And I think that that's a really, that's a fucking concerning message, but it's there, right? She wakes up out of the coma, is about to be raped. She's, she's got full faculties of her mind, right? Her mouth is working, yeah. so she's able to chew the throat out of the would-be rapist. Um, so whenever you hear other people's stories that are, you know, notably less violent, right? Um, it doesn't have the same glamour to it, right? It doesn't have the same yeah. idea of, well, I felt that this person would potentially kill me if I even said no, therefore I didn't, right? I thought yeah, to preserve my safety, I should simply let them do this rape so that I could live tomorrow, right? Um, which is a lot of survivors' experiences. So I think it's, it's just so clear to me that this was not like a uh, someone who's had this experience or really been close to this experience would portray it in such a way that is so outside the norm of the realm of of true yeah. to life experience. Yeah, and it's almost yeah. like he it's like he lacks even access to that level of empathy. Like he thinks that in order to make yeah. Uma Thurman. I don't know like I, yeah emo- this is yeah. a this is a clear example of a rape scene where it's like okay what's the worst thing that can happen to a woman so that we feel sympathy for her <laughs> you know right well, and, then, and then she has to like kill this guy in order for her to be like redeemed quote unquote yeah. from that happening yeah 
Well, and what's interesting is he does this exact thing better in the second movie. Because the Nadir in the second film that she has to then literally dig herself back out of is being buried alive, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. which yeah. is actually a much more well done and genuinely terrifying scene, mm-hmm. which then ends with her doing again some spectacularly superhuman shit of digging herself out of a coffin with, you know, Bruce Lee's infamous one inch punch. And Mm -hmm. uh, it's a much better scene, but it also tells you what he was trying to do. He honestly wasn't even thinking of it as a rape scene. He was thinking of it as a powerless scene. Mm -hmm. This is an emotional hole that she had to punch her way out of. Yeah. Because also, again, her her entire skill set is violence. Now, in the context of this character that's actually legit right she's a creature of violence who attempted a life of empathy was met with violence and has reverted to violence the problem is again this is also the way that the only way that he sees women having agency in the world is their ability to it's it's that classic problem of there's a lot of male directors who have a very, very narrow conception of what female empowerment is. Yeah. You know, with guys like Tarantino, it's their ability to uh, mask, to use masculinized violence in the world. Um, with, uh, 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 oh shit, uh, Casino, uh, Goodfellas, uh, what? Scorsese. Scorsese. Yeah. Scorsese, it's always their ability to manipulate the men in their lives um and i'm not a scorsese basher like i'm not one of those people that's like scorsese should have more women in his movies like honestly i don't think that's a good idea because he doesn't write them well yeah um but he does spend a lot of time and money and effort through his foundations like getting women to make their own movies which is definitely a much better idea than pushing oh yeah that's a much better use of his resources for sure yeah yeah rather than say hey scorsese add a second uh, uh mobster's mole in this movie yeah <laughs> right a hundred percent all right i'm i'm low on whiskey so i'm gonna go get some more whiskey yeah have, sure. a, break. Whiskey have break. a moment yeah whiskey break <laughs> need it need the fuel <laughs> whiskey break definitely sounds like a like a 60s country ballad <laughs> it does mm-hmm. maybe like a chris christopherson like 70s throwback Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> oh man, this makes me want to go watch uh Robert Rodriguez movies for some reason. I think he does a little bit a little bit better, slightly. No. No. Did Qu- did Tarantino? You don't think he does better than Tarantino? No. Really? No. <laughs> no. Interesting. Not at all. Like for all of his faults, Tarantino is actually a much better filmmaker than Robert Rodriguez. Like, let's not even pretend otherwise. <laughs> and I like Rodriguez, don't get me wrong, but he's not a whole lot better at portraying women. No. I mean, well, arguably his best developed female character is uh, 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 Selma Hayek in Dust Till Dawn. No, that's what I was thinking. That's exactly <laughs> what I was thinking. Yes. His Where's best she- <laughs> female character is the girl from Spy Kids. <laughs> oh you know what i forgot about lava girl too so there you go true yeah i mean i think he gets I, I i think that's also just like salma hayek as we've discussed elsewhere just being oh, yeah. incredible being incredibly charismatic and so like yeah. whenever she's yeah. in stuff that yeah she is constantly handed bags of dog shit and <laughs> turns them into gold yeah you know. for sure did you guys both see uh oh what's why can i not fucking remember it not Eternals. Did you guys both see Eternals? Yeah. I have not seen Eternals yet. Oh. I don't I mean, watch movies that are not for this podcast anymore, to be perfectly honest. <laughs> We're just sucking up all of your energy, Sarah, all of your movie no, energy. I have lost the focus to watch films, although I do watch like multi hour long uh, YouTube video essays. So, like, I don't know that it's a focus problem so much as the like, nah. <laughs> Sarah, you'll. 
you'll like it. We'll we'll watch Eternals. You'll okay. like it. It's a, it's a movie about uh, uh, sad gods dealing with um, it. It's 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 like a, a hundred million dollar three hour long meditation on uh, sadness, depression, family, and religion. Oh yeah, yeah that is something I would like. Yes. And all and also no. some instead some of high... doing that, I watched an eight hour um, video essay about the television show Victorious. <laughs> <laughs> nice. That showed up in my recommendations. I haven't watched it yet. No. You okay, you gotta watch the first part, which is five hours. <laughs> And then you watch the second part, which is eight hours. Joe, it is weirdly compelling. Joe, do you it know doesn't H feel like it's eight hours. Yeah. Do you, do you know H Bomber guy? Yes, I do. Did Did you see his Deus Ex video came out last week? No, I did not. Uh, it's not even about the good Deus Ex. It's oh God. <laughs> It's a three hour long video about why Deus Ex Human Revolution is fine. <laughs> <laughs> that it's basically like a C plus and he wishes it were better. <laughs> and it's three and a half hours long. It's 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 art. Excellent. <laughs> oh, also optionally, uh there are uh two uh multi-hour videos about iCarly that are technically like setups for the victorious video essays, but like mm -hmm. th those are optional. <laughs> but like if you want the complete experience. You can watch all of those. Fair. Weirdly, I never watched much of Victorious, but thanks to my children, like, well, I'm the one who watched iCarly, but thanks to my children, I have seen um, most of the episodes of uh, Sam and Max. Oh, Sam and Cat? Yeah. Or Sam yeah. and Cat. Sorry, Sam, Sam and, and Cat. Max is the cartoon. Yeah, <laughs> Sam and Cat, the, the iCarly Victorious crossover series. Oh, God. Yes. Tracy. Oh, that's, that's going to be the next video. <laughs> Oh, nice. <laughs> Tracy, we, we, we were talking about Robert Rodriguez before you know our respective thoughts. So who do you think is a better filmmaker, Tarantino or Robert Rodriguez? I could hear you. I was still wearing my headphones, oh, so I I'm can't sorry. lie. And say I, Damn not, it. I was, I was my, privy to the conversation. So. so my problem is I got this book when it was like when you and I went to Austin, I think, Tracy. And it was like a whole book on film studies about Robert Rodriguez's movies. And so I think mm -hmm. I've thought much more deeply about his movies than about Tarantino's movies. So I think mm. that's like what's that could lead, fucked me up. Yeah, that could lead to that conclusion. Here's yeah. the thing. I think his kids' movies are, he's a really good kid director. <laughs> um, well, did you? Know well, uh, like he definitely, um, like El Mariachi yeah. is one of the greatest independent films ever made. Um, 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 uh shit what's the sequel the one with uh, uh, desperado. desperado 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 i don't even know oh shit i don't even know if it's good <laughs> i love that movie i will watch it all the fucking time that is like one of those all-time great performances by rob by, by, by uh, uh antonio banderas oh. um dust till dawn the first half of it really good uh then the lizard vampires show up and it for some reason that's when the movie gets worse <laughs> I don't know. Um, but like, yeah, if you want to go ahead to hit, like, it, no one's going to watch the two halves of Grindhouse and say that Planet Terror was the better film. No, on. no, that's true. I hear you. All right. Who wants to Back take a to deep rape. dive into rape um, revenge? <laughs> All right, let's do it. Everybody collectively. Here we go. Myself. All right. Okay, let's do it. So one of my personal favorites within this genre oh, has yeah. to be Hard Candy, 2005, uh, directed by David Slade. This was Elliot Page's like breakout role, and it went mostly unnoticed in this film. Uh, Juno did not come out until 2007, right? Mm -hmm. That's when everyone remembers Elliot Page coming onto the scene, but this role and the acting of Elliot Page in this film is I shit you not like if there if there's an award that's like 10,000 times higher than an Oscar they should have got it oh for um, sure because they were so young 
when this was filmed, um, they're, they're portraying a 14 year old. I don't know how old they actually were, but um, so this is definitely one of those uh, films where it's the friend of the survivor who's enacting the revenge, right? So we start off this film with Elliot Page's character uh, having basically like catfishing uh, the perpetrator online being like, hey, I'm like a really stupid young girl and I want to like maybe experiment sexually with a man, but I don't know for real. Ha 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 Want to meet up for coffee? Right. Okay. So like that happens. Um, like the, the character is able to definitely like maneuver around the sky, get him to take them to his home um, for, you know, whatever would happen between a, a child, you know, a teenager and an, an adult. And uh, the script gets flipped. We see someone taking, like we've seen language in the other films being taken and then reversed. Uh, Elliot Page's character drugs his drink, which is a tactic we see used a lot in like a date rape, right? So, um, and the character very famously says, like, didn't anyone ever teach you not to accept drinks from strangers? Which is great. Like, it's a great yeah. fucking line. Um, and because who would expect this unassuming teenager is going to drug your drink when you're a grown man in your own home, in your castle or whatever? Um, now, the reasoning that Elliot Page is acting on behalf of the friend is because they're either missing or dead they're dead but like i it's unclear to me whether or not like they're like missing or have been found that's not necessarily important um the great one of the great things about this film is that it's re, it's all pretty much exclusively shot in this guy's house and it's just the two of them so it's just dialogue silence cinematography um and Elliot Page's character, you know, he's knocked out and they set up a scene with ice on his genitals and basically like a closed circuit TV with a video of someone performing a castration. Okay. Now they time this perfectly to where he believes because his genitals are like completely numb after having ice on them for so long that he's literally being castrated at this moment, okay? He's not, it's a, it's a farce, right? It's just to, I don't know. I didn't know, come up with a better word. I put pseudo torture because that's all I could come up with there. It's, it's, it is torture. I believe that what the, he experiences is torture. Um, however, like he remains intact um, after this scene. Um, it's very, it's very well done. Uh, you know, he's panicking, what's gonna happen, all of this shit. And of course, up until this point, he's still denying to have any knowledge about the friend, right? I don't know about your friend. I didn't touch your friend. I certainly didn't kill your friend. Eventually, Elliot Page's character is able to like decode some mysteries in the home and find that he has kept a trophy like many perpetrators do, uh, a photograph of her friend. And so Elliot Page's character basically sets him up to have like a worst case scenario happen. Uh, they realize that he has a love interest, like a uh, someone who he's pined for for years right and it's probably the reason why he's going after little girls now because he doesn't feel up to like standards of like competent women his own age um Elliot Page's character finds that woman's fucking phone number calls her ass up and is like it's an emergency at his house come quick to which she does and Elliot Page's character I'm giving the whole film away because it's fucking old right but the yeah. the whole thing is is that Elliot Page's character says so you've got like two fucking options here you can come clean right tell me exactly what's happened you know and I'll never fucking tell anybody but I need to know what's happened otherwise I'm going to tell this woman who you love 
exactly what you did to my friend. Or here's a third option. Here's a rope. We're, we're standing on a roof and you can kill yourself. Which is a really fucking intense scene. It's very intense, especially for such a young actor. Um, you were going to say something, Chris? Oh, I'm just going to say, this is one of those movies that I saw having seen, I knew nothing about it, had not seen trailers, did not know. When you don't know the twist, the, the second act of this movie is a fucking curveball. Mm. <laughs> because they don't, they don't telegraph what this movie is through the beginning. At not at all. all. Mm-hmm. And it, it takes a hard turn where you're like, oh, oh, this is the monster movie and the child is the monster. Oh, okay. Yeah, here we go. Yeah, so is this like, is it like a horror sort of feel to it or is it more just like drama? I would call it like psychological thriller yeah. is what I would say. Um, I, just because Elliot Page's character like uses their wits to like win the day mm-hmm. um, and like in really very fucking unusual and imaginative smart ways. Um now, so here's the thing, right? Like, at this point, like Chris has pointed out, Elliot Page is the fucking monster. You're feeling really bad for this fucker on the roof who has to decide, do I tell the truth, right? And have this, like, sin removed from me? Or do I, you know, and possibly have this woman, like, you know, come back into my life? Uh, do I fucking kill myself and take the secret to my grave? Um or do I just like, you know, like own up to the music, right? Like to face the fucking charges here laid out by this child against me. And in this like very gripping moment, I know that I found myself being like, wait, why the fuck do I have feelings about him? Right? Like. That's interesting because uh, that was not my experience. Ah, uh, Okay. Well, like you said, I like I very much came at this for like it is very much structured as a uh, uh, as a psychological thriller, right? Like this is not an over like a violent film. Mm-hmm. Actually, it's 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 uh it's 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 role reversals. It's a lot of uh, it's a very well like what we were talking about earlier. It's a very different take on agency. Now it's still sociopathic agency and it's still a form of violence but you have basically what you what you, at this point you have uh, almost dueling monsters but i i never at any point fail to just like okay how how be- the underlying tension is that like she's always he i'm sorry in that, in that context they're always in control in a way that you think cannot hold mm-hmm. like the visuals of the two of them, just the physical size difference, the structure of the whole thing. This is not a fantastical film. You are constantly waiting for the shoe to drop and, and you know, this to be this to go the way that you like in the gut of your t- stomach, you feel like it's going to go the whole time. And it's uh, like pages character, just staying that one step ahead through every step like it's really tense and it plays out really well it does exactly like there and there are like absolutely like moments where he breaks free from page's character and like page has to like re restrain him and like you know like it's in it right the size differential is like fantastical you know what i'm saying like Paige is a very petite human you know mm-hmm. and like even though they show that, that like Paige like sort of famously like tries to like sexualize themselves in this film by taking off their sh- their top to show them in a sports bra and like they're clearly like of an, a slim athletic build but like nothing compared to this like over six foot tall guy who's like just twice her size you know um and it's just a it's a it's a fucking hot mess but the thing is is that i did feel for the character because it occurs to me right that like in that very tense moment on the roof at the very end of the film 
how how sure are we how sure are we and that's when you know so I, it was very it was very a uh, minuscule timeline where i felt the feelings for him because then he admits it was yeah i was involved but it wasn't me it was the other guy mm. right to which Paige's character has like the best fucking response you could ever fucking hope for in that moment. Right? Because he's like, I'll give you his address. I'll fucking tell you where he lives. You go fucking take out this shit on him. And Paige's character is like, you know, it's really funny. He said the exact same thing about you. <laughs> so like, she's already done visited that motherfucker. Like vengeance is already done there. But it does make that scene so good and, and, and really plays home like that horror of it is up to that point in the film. Yeah, it is a bit ambiguous how bad this guy is. Yes. And like you're, you're seeing this personification of a uh, quiet rage that has you know, set itself upon destroying him. And there is that question of like, like, I guess there's a question of proportionality, right? Like, okay, what actually did this guy do? But that is interesting because I never once felt empathy for him at all. I did. I film. did. And I, and I didn't like it. Like, I was like, what is this? Like, but I think that I, that goes back to, and like, I can just like admit that it goes back to the fact that like this film did not start with a fucking graphic grape scene. Mm -hmm. It started mm -hmm. off with Paige sending ims to this guy on the computer yeah isn't that supposed to be like the whole point behind reve revenge films though where i mean like an old boy the end of that i'm sure we've all seen that at some point the end of that is like he's destroyed through his revenge and so like it sounds like what is happening here tracy is that the, the 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 sort of monstrousness of it is that he, that through this revenge and i've not seen this film but through this through this revenge you felt sorry for the monster because the revenge itself was so monstrous and like that's the abomination sort of i think no I she's so saying she felt she, she felt sympathy for the quote-unquote victim I, I, the the framing of the movie is interesting because he is being preyed upon. No, that's what that's what I'm saying. Crime that you're unsure of, but yeah, yeah, that's what I'm the saying. The thing though. is, is that like there is still there is ambiguity as to whether or not this individual 100 percent is a rapist and a killer. Uh -huh. There is some level of ambiguity. Paige's character is fucking sure of it. That's clear. That part is hammered home. But like there is, they leave the viewer to have some questions. Mm. And the whole thing wouldn't work if you had seen Correct. how bad would not. the act was. Yeah. Right. It wouldn't have worked at all, at all. Yeah. And so that's the thing is that, right? Like, so, you know, Paige's character, you know, famously is like giving him this, this last chance, you know, tell me everything. He tells her it wasn't me, right? It's this other guy. And she's like, awesome. You know, what do you want to do now? You know, do you want to come forward, talk to the police, blah, blah, blah. Or do you want to, you know, kill yourself? Which is fucking intense. Mm -hmm. It's fucking intense. Great He's got scene. a noose a noose around his neck. He's on the side of a roof. And the woman who he's pined for all these years is literally en route. And is about to find out the worst fucking thing he's ever done, potentially, right? And spoiler, right? It's an old movie. He fucking chooses to kill himself. And as he's hanging himself, Elliot Page's character says, or not, to, I won't tell anyone. This will just stay between us. And then they say, or not. And then they just pick up the backpack and walk away in the woods off to do their next fucking sick and twisted adventure mm -hmm. right it's fucking unreal yeah. it's a really good movie it's really good i watched it a lot for a period of time because i thought that this this fit my idea of what rape revenge like would 
feel like to an actual survivor of rape. You know what I'm saying? That literally this like this false castration thing, this torture of like, you know what? I'm going to fuck with your body. I'm going to make you feel like you're less than this thing that's associated with your gender and like feeling like, you know, strong within your gender role. I'm going to fucking steal it from you, but not actually steal it from you. I'm just going to pretend to make you feel like I did. And then I'm going to hand it back to you and be like, aren't you a fucking pussy? Right. Like, I, you know, basically. Mm-hmm. And, I just realized yeah. we've tied into last week. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. We have disembodied dicks. Where yes, <laughs> there's a lot of disembodied dicks in rape revenge films. Unfortunately, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah they're they're the uh, P- Paige's character. Like ah, okay. Excuse my pronoun shifting because the character. The character is yeah. yeah yeah yeah. Uh, they're making him surrender his agency. Mm-hmm. Like they're put like they're they're limiting it physically in these moments, mm-hmm. but there's always choices. Yep. And every step, it's, it, 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 it is interesting. It's, again, it's still, uh, you know, it's, 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 a, it's a transformed woman narrative, right? It's the becoming the spirit of vengeance. It's the, the Anya from Buffy. It's the um, every wronged woman of Greek mythology. And it is interesting to Joe's point, you know, there is that longstanding, especially when, you know, male storytellers slash filmmakers are involved. There's, you know, uh, off, very often for men seeking vengeance destroys their life because they're acknowledging an interiority that can continue past trauma, even when they themselves can't see it. Whereas a woman is transformed into a creature of agency and respect via their newfound willingness to inflict violence and Mm -hmm. effectively become masculinized. And, you know, now through the trauma, they become stronger because, I don't know, they're interesting now. (laughs) But no, but that's essentially right. And and it's, it's it's a big fucking problem. Right. Like, so like, I, I talked to Joe about this a lot, but like as an actual fucking orphan, this whole like orphan, like origin story makes me so fucking pissed because I read all of that shit when I was a kid and I was like, where are my fucking superpowers? (laughs) Like, (laughs) like I, I thought I got superpowers for going through this shit. No, I just go through this shit and people look at me awkwardly and don't know how to talk to me because I'm a kid who doesn't fucking have parents. That was yeah. the real, the real experience, right? But I yeah. read about all these fantastical them to be able to talk to fucking critters and nature and fly and shit. No, that didn't happen, right? So I think that Tracy, is- you have two choices: either, <laughs> you know, either uh, come from hereditary wealth and be frightened by a flying mammal. Yep. Or uh, live in a box car with your siblings until a millionaire adopts you. <laughs> I was always looking for number two to come true, but uh... yeah. where inexplicably you continue to live in the box car in the back <laughs> yard of the millionaire. Mm-hmm. Yep. The first that wouldn't, box that, car that... children, really good. The fact that it turned into a series is inexplicable. <laughs> <laughs> they just hold That's... on to the box car. It's so weird. Uh huh. <laughs> All right, I'm afraid that this is going to go on too long, so I am going to move forward. Yeah, By yeah. the way, this is, like, for anyone who is listening to this, this is a fucking A-plus slam dunk film. I know I've just spoiled the fuck out of it, but it's still fucking worth watching. Elliot Page kicks so much hardcore acting ass in this. It's unbelievable considering their age. Like, it's just phenomenal. Like terrifying makes Hannibal Lecter look like a kindergarten teacher (laughs) absolutely it's really good so moving forward oh oh we're taking a deep dive folks literally descending into descent 2007 film by Talia Lugasi all right this is a film that I will say with no hesitation 
I do not recommend that anyone ever watch this film. No. I absolutely do not recommend that anyone ever watch this film under any circumstances. If you are a human being with a heart and a mind, you'll be severely impacted by this film in a negative way. I, unfortunately, watched the NC-17 version of this film. Mm. Not knowing what I was in for, I honestly did not know the nature of this film and rented it from a fucking actual rental place thinking it was like, because she's upside down on the cover, Rosario Dawson. I thought it was one of those fucking like cave adventures gone wrong. Oh, so was I in for a fucking twist whenever? Yeah. There's another fucking film called something like Descent. Yeah. That's called The Descent. And it came out like a year before. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was it was misleading as fuck. So I watched this one, and I'm like, "Oh, cool! It's Rosario Dawson. Right on! Exciting! Uh, this is a very pretty person to stare at for the duration of a film. I'm into it. All right, so let's let's dive into this. So Rosario Dawson is the survivor of the rape in this film, and the rape is shown early in the film and is a horribly degrading scene uh on top of just the actual violence the sexual violence the rapist continues to like just like demean her verbally throughout the event okay so it's it's hitting on all fronts of assault um somehow she ends up in a situation where she becomes his teacher right during her arc of i would say like de-evolution at this point because she's falling apart this rape has severely impacted her she is uh you know like using drugs um her relationships are struggling she is not finding the support she needs and she makes a friend with a guy and and so anyway she becomes the rapist teacher she finds out that this fucker cheated and she uses that as the entryway to get her vengeance, right? So she says, all right, like, you know, you don't want me to report the cheating. All right, come out with me. We'll talk about it. And then basically does use her sort of sexuality, her beauty, um, to lure him into a location where vengeance can be enacted. So this film was not well received at all. And for very good reasons. Um, the initial rape scene, not easy, not, not easy to deal with. But the revenge scene is something that like, I have like a really good recall of it. And like, I haven't seen this shit since it came out. I still remember parts of it. And like, I don't want to. It's like just in my psyche forever um so essentially what rosario dawson's character does is enlist someone to like act as like a proxy to do like eye for an eye vengeance so this guy who she meets who's a dj she gets him to repeatedly rape her rapist right yeah repeatedly rape her rapist and um i put in here because i i was very curious about this in my research i found that so the r-rated version is pretty edited but still real fucked up okay but in the nc-17 version there is an additional seven full minutes of this rape continuous re-raping of the original rapist it is torturous it is uh dehumanizing in every possible way and honestly like i clocked it like i actually watched the clock and i think it was like an 11 minute scene it was preposterously long um one minute of it would have been too much one minute 
of that degree of violence and humiliation inflicted upon a human. Um, and so one of the things that uh, critics have really focused on or honed in on was that Rosario's character doesn't really have this positive transformation. They're just focused on the, the revenge and the film really focuses on the revenge act itself versus her personal transformation, which to be honest, isn't going well. Like her personal transformation like has some high points, but it's got a lot of low points too. And I was really struck by Rosario Dawson's character cries during the revenge scene, but I felt like it was really unclear what those tears were representing. Are they like a cathartic release that vengeance has been done? Or is this something else? Is this like that character realizing that like nothing's going to fucking change the fact that this, this guy raped her, right? Like nothing's going to be able to fix that or make that better in any way. Um, but it's very ambiguous. It's like, I think it's very much left up to the viewer to like figure out how you feel about her tears. Um, so overall, I would say that while like a plus for putting her in charge of her own story, um, you know, as far as this film goes, it's, it's a, it's like a nightmare to watch, mm -hmm. which is more accurate to rape experience um, but, uh, I, especially to people who have been directly impacted by sexual violence or someone who they love has been directly impacted by sexual violence, I would say at all costs, do not watch this film. Yeah. It's not healthy. So I included it because I think it's an important piece within the canon of the genre because it takes it to extremes. Um, and it takes it very literally. He, he is raped, right? He raped her and then he is raped. And uh, that's not often the way these, these films go. Mm -hmm. uh, it's generally some other form of torture and it could be something that's clearly like somehow still in the sexual realm like mutilation or removal of genitals. But this guy's literally raped repeatedly. Um, so... With that being said, Rosario Dawson's an amazing actor, does a good job in this film. This film is just painful to experience. Like I said, if you're a human who has like human emotions, um, it's just it's just hard to to process. So we will move forward. Hey, hey, do you know who made a much better revenge film with Rosario Dawson? Who? Quentin Tarantino. I know. That's what I was going to say. I, I totally thought you were going to say Clerks too, Chris. I don't know why, but I thought you were. You know, Kevin Smith, king of the revenge film. Oh my goodness. So have you all heard of this movie? Because I had not even heard of this one when I started doing my research. This one I've never heard of. No. Okay. So I watched it today and like there's a this fair is a podcast. amount. Of you might want to name the film. The name oh, yeah. is MFA, like a Master of Fine Arts, the abbreviation. It was in 2017. Um, I found a lot of stuff written about this film. I think it is primarily because we have a woman directing the film and a woman writing the film. So it's Natalia Lete directed and Leah McKendrick wrote. Um, so I think that that's the first thing that really started to set this film apart from its, uh, you know, compatriots here. Um, also a very different sort of story regarding how revenge gets handed out. So this is unique in that we're focusing on a rape that occurs on college campus. We do get the, you know, visceral rape scene at the start of the film. A uh, young woman is, you know, studying for her master's in fine arts. Um, she goes to visit a boy she likes. And essentially, she thinks that they're going to make out. 
he thinks that they're going to, well, no, he thinks he's going to get to rape her and get away with it and proceeds is essentially how it goes. So um, she talks to her roommate about it and her roommate is like, look, you could let this ruin your life or you can just get over it. This is a female roommate. And the female roommate says, I had a friend that this happened to on campus and they made her feel like a slut. They made her feel like she was a drunk because she was at a party and it was basically he said, she said, right? Which is classic, right? We're all familiar with this, not necessarily from movies, but just from real fucking life. And so essentially the protagonist here uh, decides to confront the man who attacked her and demands an apology, which is a really interesting thing to do, right? She mm-hmm. goes to him because she went to she went to the campus administrators and realized that they were doing exactly what her roommate told her they were going to do. How much did you have to drink? What were you wearing? Did you willingly go into a room alone with him? All of these questions, right? And she realizes that that's going on a train to nowhere, right? So she takes it upon herself. She goes to visit him at his home. He's very casually smoking a joint and just laughing at her. She said, I came here because I want you to apologize. He said, what for, fucking you? And she said, no, for raping me. He denies that that's what's occurred. And she very casually shoves him, which I think someone could do in that moment with no malice intended, but he falls to his death off of a railing. Okay. Um, So then you see the beginning of her evolution. What do you do in this circumstance, right? You just pushed him. There's no clarity given to the viewer whether or not at this point the character intended for him to die, right? Um, Doesn't seem like it to me, Uh, but he's dead as fuck. And you just talked to the college administrators and alleged he raped you. So how the fuck is this going to look if you're the one who calls 911 and says, motherfucker's dead. What was I doing there? It's just asking him to apologize for raping me. Right? Most people are going to say, I'm going to fucking duck out. I'm going to duck out right now. We'll deal with that shit tomorrow. Okay? That's what she does. And, you know, she says, yeah, I did see him. He seemed real fucked up on drugs. I don't know. He's a weird guy. Right. She starts to move forward, move on. And essentially she starts to learn about what's like rape all about on my college campus. You know, so she learns that in the previous year, another female student had alleged that three popular fraternity brother football playing guys had gang raped her. She then finds the video evidence of the rape, views it, decides to approach this other survivor and be like, what, you know, like, can I learn from you? What has happened here? How do we, how do we make this work? How do we get justice? Right. And essentially the tale that gets shared with her from her fellow survivor is I wish I never told anyone. It would have been better for me as a survivor of rape to have never fucking told anyone. Because now everyone thinks I'm a fucking whore. Everyone treats me differently. They treat them like they're fucking golden. But I'm treated like the bad guy because I almost fucked their lives up. Mm -hmm. Right? On a college campus, which we all know is far too common of an occurrence. Well, who is the affluenza guy? Was that the one... Brock Turner. We're which talking is, about him. Which is exactly what happened. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So here's the thing. She learns like what a clear report is. 
and finds the one for her college. And it lists zero sexual assaults for the previous year. Right? Zero. And this enrages her. And so she's already inadvertently killed her own rapist. So she then takes it upon herself to kill the three rapists involved in the other survivor's rape. And this happens like rapid fucking fire. She finds out about them. She meets the survivor. She does go to like a... uh, it's it's a really good scene she goes to visit a club a campus club which like we all know what those fucking look like right and it's a bunch of campus fucking college students sitting around feeling real self-congratulatory about making a difference in the world because they're gonna like screen some video on campus about like a assault survivor in brazil and she was like she shows up she's like what can we do for people here on this campus who get fucking raped what do we do here and everyone's like, whoa, hey, chill out. And then it's great because then they bring up, you know what we should really make sure all incoming freshmen get next year is that nail polish that changes color whenever you put it in your drink to detect a date rape drug. To which she has like the, the best honest reply of like, or maybe people will stop fucking drugging drinks and raping people. Maybe we invest in that versus fucking nail polish. Mm-hmm. And everyone's like, well sounds like you're a little on the angry side but we make a difference on this campus so like you see that this character explores their options available on its typical u.s campus right like they really try to find a way to feel some sense of rightness in the world after this traumatic event and like it's just not available to them so they have to take it into their own hands. And so what is pictured here is one of the uh, three rapists of the other survivor that she attacks while he's in the shower. And this does give a moment where you think like, oh shit, she's going to get taken down. Because like at this point, she's just like, she just goes willy nilly, just like she's just fucking killing every motherfucker available that she knows has committed a rape, right? And this guy actually knocks her down for a minute. And she's like, it, it's a little kill bill that she like overpowers him very quickly, gets her hammer back and just fucking annihilates him. Um, she does do another interesting thing, which she goes to. So she ends up and like uses her feminine wiles, her sexuality to get access to records, finds out that her roommate, the the, the girl who said, don't report it. I had a friend who did that. She finds a file on that friend. And then that friend was talking about herself. Which is not surprising, right? And she reads in her file that as part of the college's investigation, they sent her to see the college psychiatrist. And this person diagnosed her with everything available. So she goes to visit the psychiatrist or psychologist or whatever. And she just lays into this woman and she's like, hey, guess what? You're done. It's over. I know what you do. You're helping the college cover this up. And like the gig is up. So you can either leave and disappear or I'll fucking kill you. Which is like that point in the the de-evolution of this character where essentially like the vigilante spree of violence is so high um it's it's a lot to handle um unfortunately we do see again it's not a new movie so i'm gonna say this that her roommate ends up and takes their own life after she attacks that rapist and is cut short of ending his life which I think brings to the fore this idea that she had made clear from the beginning, which was she was trying to move on from her trauma in a very different way than the main character of this film. Mm -hmm. And it was not respected by the main character. 
she brought her trauma back into the fore and said, something has to be done about this. Taking away her agency and what she felt like was best for her and said, this is a bigger issue than just you. It impacts all of us and I'm gonna fucking do this, right? And um, it's, it's a very interesting film. I think it's very clear that it was directed and writ- written by women because the female characters are like very, uh, boy, I don't say full body. That doesn't make sense. They're, they're 3D characters with yeah. like, you know, dimension. Um, and uh, there's a lot going on, but it's definitely a very interesting film. And I think it really does speak to the specific phenomenon of rape on a college campus in the United States. I real quick was digging through like reactions because I had not heard of this movie. Yeah, me neither. Surprisingly, no. No. It, was a, it was a South by Southwest uh, jury winner. Oh, wow. um, mm-hmm. Apparently also uh, uh, had the interesting fortune of landing right at the beginning of the Me Too blow up. It but, did, uh, yes. The... Uh, it, it is interesting because I was also quietly watching the trailer as you were talking, and it's like, it is interesting what you're talking about. It, like, you know, this woman, you know, removing the agency of others and how they deal with it, because this is framed as like the origin story of a serial killer. Right. <laughs> right. Like, she, it, you say de evolution, that is not how this seems to be portrayed from the stuff that I'm reading and looking at right now, where they're. It's like, oh no, this is uh, this 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 is a uh, oh oh. Turns out it, it uh, really uh, it inspires me to uh, kill people. <laughs> I mean, I think the underlying message is that anyone who has to deal with the campus bureaucracy after they get raped on that campus would probably want to kill people. I mean, I sort of understand that part of it. <laughs> like that's it's fucked up. I mean, like even, well, so like, Chris, are you um, on your campus? Are you a mandated reporter in your job? Or is it like, is it like everyone on your campus? Or is it just if you supervise students? It's um, pretty much anyone. Definitely if you supervise students. But yeah, it's it's, it's pretty broad at this point where it's like almost any university employee right a, yeah that's that's how we are too it's like there's that and then there's like a, a level well tracy you were that too when you uh worked at the campus where there's like a level above there's like everyone's a mandated reporter and then there's like some people who have very specific roles and then there's like the people who technically don't have to report it because they're what like like a therapist or something is that what it is Yeah, a therapist would not report a rape without their without, client's yeah. permission. Yeah, and really, yeah. they wouldn't be the one making the report. It would be the client making the report. So. But it's it's super fucked up because, like, listeners, if you don't know, um, a lot of college campuses have, like, these behind-closed-doors committees um, that are they're, – they're almost, like – I mean, they're like quasi judicial, but they're uh, a lot of times they'll just they'll hear someone will like accuse another student of rape and then they'll hear the sides and they'll like try to make a judgment, I guess, to keep the kid from going to the police. Is that what it's for? Like, I don't fully understand. Well, it's generally well, a big part of this is that it's generally first reported to campus police, not a city or a right. village or whatever police department. So then it's their jurisdiction. And if it occurred on the college campus, it's their jurisdiction. Right. But then the college and or university has their own set of standards on how they hand out discipline to their students separate than that police department, right? But they tend to be very interlinked and like information sharing bodies. Right. Um, and because like you're saying, Tracy, a lot of times the person who gets raped does not like press charges, for example, um, for all kinds of reasons. But then the mm-hmm. campus police will, but then, you know, the, the survivor might go to the campus authorities and say, can you at least like get him the fuck out of my class? So we're not in the same class anymore or something. Um, but yeah, it's not well done. 
the problem becomes at this point almost big asterisk almost and i i want to throw this out there saying i'm mostly talking about public universities at this point private universities are a whole other giant mess yeah oh my god looking at you liberty university that's a whole that's a whole yes. other problem there no uh the police will are the first step the um how do i put this politely you know what fuck it i'm not putting it politely uh cops and courts don't like getting involved in domestic disputes which is how they're pretty much going to categorize anything short of he a stranger kicked down the door and put a gun to my head even then the standard of evidence is so fucking high that very rarely do the police or the courts have the ability translation want to get involved in prosecuting a case like this so then it goes back to well okay this didn't reach the level of a criminal offense but is this now a code of conduct offense which then literally gets you into he said she said situations where there is a strong reticence on the part of the university to take overly punitive action after this person has seemingly been already um like not prosecuted right so it i'm not and i'm not saying that as an excuse for the universities you know some handle it better than others most handle it very poorly but the it, it does start with the the state completely abdicating itself of the responsibility of basically anything that happens on a college campus unless it destroys state property yeah <laughs> and like well and yeah. like Trace, tracy to your earlier point the other thing is as the the survivor you have to tell your you have to relive like one of the worst days of your life a hundred times before you even would ever get yeah. to court right so there's that, there's like, you're burning the candle at both ends in that way. And so by the time, right. yeah, yeah. No, there's, yeah, there's a lot that goes into it. And we are gonna discuss this more in a, in a like a epilogue, but Joe has alerted me to the fact that this episode is going long. So I'm gonna pick up the pace a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I had to watch this one for this podcast because I had avoided watching it because I was unsure. So Promising Young Woman came out in 2020. Um, this film was met with great praise and critical acclaim. I believe it was even nominated for Beck's Picture of the Year in 2020 by the Academy, um, which I found fairly surprising. Um, but um, directed by Emerald Fennell. And so essentially here we do see like in Hard Candy, that we have a friend seeking vengeance on behalf of a friend who is unavailable. And what is, there's a couple different things that like really flip the script or create a new script for Promising Young Woman. And it really is seen critically as a departure from the old style, like this one's setting the bar for what everyone else should be able to accomplish. So we're spared any gratuitous sex scene, rape scene in the beginning of the film, right? There's no, I, you know, no worrying about this pornographic portrayal. Um, we learn that the main character, Mia here, is uh, struggling to cope after her best friend has taken her own life following being raped while they were in med school. So another campus rape right um and so mia herself uh dropped out of school and is working at a coffee shop and living at home and her evolution transformation here is essentially that she's been taking out vengeance on any available party who presents himself as a potential perpetrator so every weekend she goes out to a different bar club place of socialization and pretends to be 
a very intoxicated and vulnerable woman and waits for that like honey trap to pay off with some very nice gentleman coming over and offering her help. And she essentially goes along for the ride as far as she can, barring them, essentially raping her pretended to be in- incapacitated person. At which point she this then it's this is dubbed by many as like a dark comedy so and there are some comedic moments i wouldn't really put it there but um where it is very funny though in the like a very early scene where she's like she just all of a sudden goes from like wasted to like fully competent and the look on the guy's face is pretty priceless and funny (laughs) right he was he was just convinced I'm going to be able to, in his mind, not rape, but fuck this woman. This is going to be fucking great. This is so easy. I don't have to do shit. She's wasted, whatever. To being confronted by a fully functioning, aware human saying, what the fuck do you think you're doing to me and my personhood? And then essentially her sitting down with that person and like having like a heart to heart about whether or not they're going to change their ways in the future. Right? So she's got like this little notebook where it just shows her like making like little scratch marks for like all of the people she's done this to. It seems like it's a lot. It seems like it's a lot. Um, you know, she makes these guys very uncomfortable. These are very uncomfortable scenarios. But I think that a lot of rape survivors could find a lot of catharsis in what she's doing. Because she's not, she's not torturing these guys. She is deceiving them. She is absolutely exploiting her sexuality, right? Her uh, beauty, um, her ability to, you know, uh, manipulate them by deceiving them. She's doing all of those things, but she's not actually harming them in any physical way. She's essentially challenging them to look at themselves in the mirror and say, can you admit that you are just going to rape me because you thought I was too drunk to consent? And basically saying, I'm not leaving until we have this conversation. Which does set a new bar in this genre. I will have to admit. Because I think that for many rape survivors, that is something that does sound like it could amount or equate to some level of justice. To be able to confront the perpetrator of your violent act and say, so tell me, what gave you the right to do this? Like, honestly, explain it to me. What what makes the beginning of the movie interesting is the fact that she is preemptively confronting rapists. Right, before the rape act has occurred. Yes. Mm -hmm. Where it it is that interesting move where it it, it is like, what could I have done if? Like, what would they have said if? Because it, uh, uh, the more interesting moments of the movie are dealing with um, ambiguous consent more than assault. Um, I'm sure she's getting there, but this movie then takes a really wild Book of Henry twist. (laughs) going into the last act absolutely no i think that there's so much going on here that i really like there's a lot of good um first of all it's like an all-star cast i don't remember the names of all the famous actors but they're in there you should watch it you should see them do their thing Bo Burnham Laverne cox is really good in this Bo burnham is really good and laverne cox plays like a fun friend they don't really give her much to do with unfortunately but um What's so interesting here is that unlike most rape revenge films, you do see this a little bit in MFA, the one I previously talked about, um, the, the revenge seeker does have a love interest in this film. And that's, that's fairly uncommon, right? To see them like having a healthful, like sexual 
realized relationship with someone that isn't based on like either sexualized violence or just violence in general to like people you know who are perceived to have hurt them so she starts to have a relationship with a guy who she knew from school i.e the place where this original rape occurred the original trauma point and you watch her start to fall for this guy right and she had put up a lot of walls this is a very harmed person by the trauma that her friend endured right and then the trauma of her friend ending her life by suicide and everything's going pretty well it seems like this character's evolution is going a very specific way when then what do you know right Mm -hmm. (laughs) she sees a video that shows that he was present the guy she's dating was present at the time that the gang rape occurred to which this character fully implodes rightfully so right i think everyone feels like it's very justified now one thing that this film does that i think uh is also noteworthy is that she exacts vengeance on a female friend by basically again like with what she was doing with the would-be rapist putting her in the position of her friend who woke up the day after an assault and said, what the fuck? Am I crazy? What happened? I don't understand. I don't feel right. You know, the world's falling in on me, right? So she sets her friend up to get wasted and then to have an actor be present in a hotel room whenever she wakes up after sleeping. So she basically just sets the scene for this woman to feel quite certain she was raped or that she was unable to consent due to her alcohol consumption, but gives her no, like the actor is not told to speak to her, you know, tell her anything else. So this woman then starts calling the main character here over and over and over again. She doesn't respond. She doesn't respond. And it's she, the whole reason that she meted out this vengeance on her is because she didn't show much empathy whenever she brought up their, you know, uh, their shared friend who was raped, right? Um, so this woman shows up at her doorstep fucking frantic I don't know what happened the other day when we had lunch Jesus Christ my life is falling apart I'm losing it I feel like I might have cheated on my husband I don't know if I cheated I don't know if I was raped I don't know what's going on and you see this character have like real empathy in that moment that I might have taken this shit too far that was what I took it as. I don't know about you, Chris, but like, that's what I took it as is like, maybe I fucking went too far with her. Um, and essentially that's when she's handed this video, you know, but go ahead, Chris. No, like you said, yeah, her Carrie Mulligan, fantastic performance in this movie. Yeah. Um, honest to God, if, if, if you all are sitting there wondering what the turn is for this movie, like, up and up through this point, she is portrayed as a human being reacting to not being able to move past something, reacting to this uh, the you know this trauma, this 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 thing that she's trying to deal with in ways that she feels like maybe will be helping. And again, I don't want to jump forward on you, but it it, it takes such a fucking turn. What's like, the turn? You talk about the turn that you're talking about while I get some more whiskey in my cup. Explain your turn because I think it's a different one than what I'm thinking of. Well, the turn is the ending when she book of Henry's these guys. <laughs> you're gonna have to elaborate on that, my guy. <laughs> um, yeah, I'll I'll, I'll 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 let Tracy get through the end of this movie where again it goes from her reacting to the world around her in, you know, like fantastical but understandable and emotionally grounded ways and then slowly turns into um, her turning into a uh, like Sherlockian suicide bomber. (laughs) 
Yeah, I so I was uh, like walking through the living room while Tracy was watch was watching this, and I came in during the. This is the one with Molly Shannon in it, right? Where Molly Shannon is like her friend, or is it not? Oh, that's Tracy when she gets back. There's like a scene where she goes to see. She like goes. Yes, yes, this yes. is the one with Molly Shannon. Yes. Okay, so Molly Shannon, okay. is, Molly Shannon is her friend's mom. Is that right? Is oh, that what it is? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Okay. So like she goes, she goes to Molly Shannon's house, her friend's house, and Molly Shannon is like, you can't keep coming back here. And that's like what you're talking about, Chris, where she clearly can't. That's like where she's still in the human phase and she clearly can't like get past a thing that happened. But go ahead, Tracy, if you want to. No, I know. I think that I mean, I think that, yeah, Chris, you're making a good point. We got a major plot twist. I already put a spoiler alert on here. She fucking dies. And like, not just like gets dead, gets dead bad. And it's it's basically taking the place of the rape scene. Right. She's trying to enact her revenge on the original rapist. Right. I won't go into all the details and ruin everything for you. But she gets access to him again. It's it's here as she's pictured here as this nurse stripper. Right. She uses that that sexual appeal, gets access to his motherfucker, and he just fucking kills her. Not but the what? end of the movie. <laughs> but that's the great part is that that isn't the end of the movie. Yeah, the, the the extent to which that it's definitely framed that uh, she planned all of this. <laughs> yes. That, 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 that she arranged for her own murder and also for her murderer to be exposed. Again, it, I'm, I, 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 don't, I'm not, I don't know if I'm saying it's a bad, but it's a, it's a, it's a wild turn from the rest of the movie. Right. Well, because I think that it can be interpreted as her essentially being at a point where she is ready to sacrifice her life to this end, to the end mm. of like the, the vengeance being fully achieved and that her friend's original rape, the original fucking sin of this all to be brought before the courts because this is one of the few films where it's actually clearly leading towards a police, you know, judicial system type of like justice that's right. going to be meted out. With the acknowledgement that, you know, rape will not get there. It needs to be murder. It's going to be her murder that gets these guys put in jail, but she's providing everyone with all the evidence of the rape. Right? Um, so she's in solidarity with her friend. In this moment, it's like her true moment of solidarity with the friend is the sacrifice, you know. Uh, and so the the line that I have quoted here, you didn't think this is the end, did you? It is now. It's really great. She sends a scheduled text message to these fuckers that like, you know, go ahead, Chris. She has time like she has timed out the delivery of packages and text messages <laughs> to various people. Again, it's it, it gets, which is you know I don't know. Spoiler alert for one of the worst movies ever made. Uh, the Book of Henry. Uh, Henry dies in the, in the first act of the film, and the rest of the movie <laughs> are people carrying out this elaborate revenge murder plot laid out by uh, a, a tw like a fourteen year old. <laughs> But anyway, yep. but yeah, no, this like elaborate clockwork of things that has to happen after she is murdered and cremated. Yep. But she is like, like somehow like she knew she would be cremated and had a metal necklace on that could still be identified in the ashes. And yeah, it, it's a real, real clockwork sequence of events that would have had to have gone exactly like like it's one of those moments where she just read ahead in the script and said <laughs> okay here's what i need to do yeah it's very fortuitous that everything aligned with this plan but it's uh 
it's a really interesting right like it's a, a departure from a lot of other films in a lot of ways um and it, uh it's yeah. also a little cheap in that mm -hmm. she's acknowledging that she went too far vis-a-vis -vis, you know traumatizing the friend but then it, i'm not a huge fan of the um absolving the character of guilt via death thing mm -hmm. like yeah. it's sometimes it works sometimes sometimes it's most of the time no most of the time it's a like a ben solo moment of like <laughs> i know i killed a trillion people but like here in this moment i'm kind of cool and i'm gonna die so you can all remember me well <laughs> right i definitely recommend watching this because i think it's very i think it's like it's it's interesting it takes some twists and turns um the lead actor here does a really great job with this complex character um and moving forward all right these are some things i just wanted to point out in case it wasn't clear i'm aware that a lot was omitted from this conversation including films mostly from outside the united states tv shows or adaptations of the genre films focusing on male survivors films showcasing talent from BIPOC creators and films representing LGBT voices. In some circumstances, it's because there's not very many films that are representative from that group. Yeah. Not because there's not stories to share from that group, but because they probably wouldn't be box office hits. Uh, yeah. Most rape revenge films are not some you know do you know pass that bar and uh and do it and also just a full disclaimer that i only included my favorite slash most horrific film experiences in this presentation um lots of things did not get included oh how do i go backwards okay uh hit backspace uh oh i fucked up <laughs> <laughs> so tracy would you no. say it's okay you got you're fine just go down to the slide. Would you say that most rape revenge films are made for men, male audiences? I don't know that most people would venture that far. Yeah. Um, I think the viewpoint of it, like the actual sightedness of it is, mm -hmm. I think the, uh, the storylines, um, does this work? Yeah, that's you got. You're good. You're good. Okay. Uh, the real uh, issue being that most of them are made by men. Regardless, right. yeah. I think I think that 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 is essentially like the biggest issue inherent in it, and that we're not hearing about male survivors. We're not hearing about trans survivors. You know what I'm mm. saying? Like we're yeah. not we're not hearing about survivors of same sex relationships. Um, who are like, statistically are, much more likely to be like the victims of all kinds of stuff. There are so many voices that have been marginalized within this genre, right? And yeah. uh, and that's it's very unfortunate because essentially what we primarily see is like a white cis het woman um, being victimized, and she's the symbol of like purity and chasteness. And then revenge happens on the baddies. That's mm -hmm. essentially what happens. And like, there's obviously so many more stories to tell than just that one story. Hey, 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 women of color can make shitty revenge films <laughs> as well. True. Looking at you, Halle Berry's enough. Oh, God. <laughs> and that Halle Berry's bad. Catwoman. <laughs> <laughs> was that, I didn't see Halle Berry's Catwoman. Was that this, was it the same thing where she got like assaulted and then? Where she got like thrown in a dumpster? No, no, no. It's a uh, it's a uh, Egyptian cat magic. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Not naturally. Naturally. <laughs> okay. Which well, here, also gonna... makes her really good at basketball. Yeah. You know? Right. Of course. <laughs> of course. Like, like Teen Wolf. <laughs> right. Yes. Okay. Right. Wrapping things around to what impact does this film genre have on real life experiences? Because I think it does more than other film genres. 
Um, I bring up the idea, and this is just me throwing it out there. We have some movies that come close, but we've not seen an actual movie film that's taken on the Brock Turner case. Mm. And we won't for the following fucking reasons that I present to you. So Brock Turner, AKA rape is caught in the act of rape. Who is famously sentenced to only six months in jail and only served three because of his so-called good behavior. So let's talk about the real world implications of such a tale being highly publicized. Um, so when a rape occurs, typically it is hard to get a conviction as there are rarely eyewitnesses to the act, right? This is, this is true of all rape scenarios, right? Did anyone see this other individual violate your body in this sexual manner? In most cases, the answer is unequivocally no. We are the only two parties present, right? What is so shocking in the Brock Turner case is that we have not one, but two sober, sound of mind individuals who witnessed him in the act of the crime of raping another individual. Um, so especially difficult are cases like we were talking about before, where rape occurs on a college campus and is handled by campus police and college administrators. So was the case in Brock Turner, right? Stanford was the school he was at. Um, so we see that at play as well, right? They want to cover everything up. They want to look good. They don't want their statistics on the Cleary report to look bad. They want to have as few crimes as possible. All that stuff. So then when the survivor has ever on that day in question, willingly ingested any mind-altering substance, including alcohol, it becomes even harder to secure a case against the rapist can be go before a court. So if the individual who has been raped admits at any point in time that any alcohol has been consumed, essentially the tactics by police and college administrators is to then flip the script and say, so let's talk about you for a minute versus what a perpetrator has done. Let's start diving deeper into what was going on with you in this moment of question, because you had one beer. And that really sends a signal that you're not a reliable witness. You're not reliable to tell us the truth, right? So uh, that becomes a major issue. Just a personal note, um, you know, in the case of Brock Turner being sentenced, the judge famously spoke about how his life would be severely negatively impacted for the rest of his life because he would have to be registered as a sex offender for the rest of his life. So I just want to point out to anyone who's not aware, the sex offender registry system is a total failure in attempting to prevent sexual violence and ensuring public safety. I could do a whole nother podcast on that, but that's essentially the long and short of it. So then what we are left with is that oftentimes survivors of rape will fear that coming forward to police will not result in justice of any kind. And then the case against Brock Turner reinforces such fears as being entirely legitimate. Look, in this case, we had someone literally being raped in a public space, on a college campus, two sober individuals witnessed the event, intervened, detained him, gave their statements, and he was given a six month sentence. So what does that say to any individual who experiences rape themselves? And I just bring this, I'm trying to bring this full circle because if this whole rape revenge genre is meant to be cathartic, where is the catharsis here? Right? Yeah. Yeah. Because 
you know, people have to uh, consider their options when reporting a rape and consider the harm that may happen to them by simply reporting the rape, additional harm, I would say. Mm -hmm. um, even though when they know full well the fucking truth about what has occurred, right? And what does justice really look like? I think justice is a, it's different to everyone what that word means, what that concept means, which is why I think you have a genre like this exist and be so multifaceted because justice or vengeance or these ideas of completion and closure and moving forward look very different to so many of us. And I will wrap up on the really positive note of saying for anyone who is a survivor or who loves someone who is a survivor of sexual assault or rape, you should believe them. And the phone number to Rain, which is the National Sexual Assault uh, Hotline, is 1-800-656-4673. And it's always our responsibility to advocate for legislation in our local and state areas to include funding for services of survivors of sexual assault, including the testing of rape kit backlogs across our local, state, and national areas. And then to positive. also not use that information moving forward for prosecuting victims. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Full That's stop on that. The very Jesus. fucking least. Jesus Christ. Yeah. Thanks, San Fran. Always leading the way. <laughs> Always. <laughs> Always leading the way. Which just shows us once again that cops suck. It's a special, oh, it's a special kind of hell for the for someone who does that shit. Like it's oh, it's real specific. If I if I could fucking pay money. To like be like, well, what sort of purgatory is this fucker going to? Like, uh, I got, I got some ideas. Yeah, yeah. There's a, there's like an eighth circle of hell for that person. <sighs> well, Tracy, Something that like that, that was that was uh, really well done. Good job. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. I'm sorry, that was you. really much longer than I thought it would be. No, it was fine. <laughs> I mean, I feel like if you're going to cover that topic, it's better to be thorough for sure. Yeah. We, we did not need like this amount of time for my presentation on werewolf boners. I don't think <laughs> right, that was necessary. Right. Or, 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 or like uh, nests of dicks. No, that was, that was like 50 <laughs> minutes tops. I mean, we can, um, Tracy, do you want me to break this into two episodes or do you want to just, I can just make it one. It's up to you. I think just make it one. Just I don't one. think so many people will listen, give like a very clear content warning. Oh, oh, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. I'll let you help me set it up. Just so like, this would be like one up. of the, this would be like a real fucking bummer. If there's not a content, warning. <laughs> you're just yeah. like, out, you're just like out for a walk casually and just listen. Yeah. No, but seriously, like you want to preserve people's like sanity and safety. Yeah. You know? Oh man. I don't know yeah. that I would listen to this on like a commute into the office, you know, <laughs> no. but exactly like or this might be something you choose to listen to but you choose like a time and place that's the yeah, best spot for, sure. for you to yeah. listen to it okay this is our very special episode yeah, yeah exactly <laughs> this is the after school yeah so yeah next time we'll either be doing like a regular episode or it'll be back to me and i'll be doing a presentation on like explaining the subunits of k-pop group nct or some shit and it'll be, <laughs> it'll be fun. yeah I mean, I was going to ask, do we want to do an in-person episode next time? And we could just all do like our entertainment info dumps of like shit we've been watching. <laughs> like, <do> we, <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm open to anything, but yeah, like we, we did. Um, Inexplicably, literally everyone is telling me I have to see the Batman. Yeah. Same, yeah. Which the trailers, except for Robert Pattinson and that car, you know, the pretty things. Yeah. Uh, didn't really make me want to see. Oh, uh, Zoe Kravitz. Of yeah, course. I was gonna say Zoe Kravitz is also in this movie. Yes. Right. Um, like nothing about the trailers is just like, oh, this is the thing that I want in my life. But then literally everyone, including Aaron, are yelling about how good they are. So I guess we have to. 
Aaron made me see like all the Superman movies. So just, you know. <laughs> oh, oh yeah. Aaron is yeah. a DC, he is a DC guy. So. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you know, the one where the kid murdered the guy wasn't so bad. <laughs> Oh, did Tracy not see Superman Returns? I don't think so. so. (laughs) Oh, yeah. Oh, where Superman's uh, uh, child that he didn't know he had uh, murders a man with a piano. (laughs) Just like, just just literally throws it at the guy and turns him into a stain somewhere a county (laughs) over. That is what happens. I like that. That sounds pretty good. Oh, my God. The movie is actually incredibly didn't... boring, actually. Yeah, that that's the thing. real problem of Superman it's Returns. Like, it's just not that not... interesting. And then uh, it, it kills a guy. Yeah. Right. We'll, uh, yeah, so we'll, we'll figure out what we're going to do with the next one. Um, I don't know. We can just do, like, we can watch a movie again, or we can just get together and just do, like, a weird, informal, structuralist, just, you know. Yeah, we right would just make a list of like the media they've consumed over the past couple of months. Yeah. <laughs> oh, oh, mine's gonna be so fucking weird. It'll be great. You know I mean? It'll be great. It'll be, be like, I watched a bunch of Korean variety shows. <laughs> <laughs> and a well, lot of eight-hour video essay. I want to fucking hear about that. Like, okay, that's I will tell you like about the Korean variety movie. shows. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Eight hour video essays. <laughs> oh, it's, I did start a really good podcast. I'll tell you about the really good podcast. Okay. Uh, well, wait, I wanted to ask you earlier, but I was afraid mm-hmm. that I was going to sound like an idiot. But what do you mean when you say video essay? Oh, oh. it's just like a really long um, video, just like doing a critical breakdown of like whatever topic. Yeah. So, like, I see. Okay. Yeah. So, like, it can, like, it, it can be like gone about in like a bunch of different ways but like uh the one I was watching the the victorious one it was like an episode by episode breakdown like trying to determine like uh how this show failed because like uh victorious is like a pseudo spinoff of iCarly that was like a very pop like that was like the most popular Nickelodeon like live action show ever and um and then uh, the follow-up Victorious was like widely considered to be like a letdown afterwards. So it's like a, a very like long in-depth critical examination of that. Uh, but also there are a lot of tangents because like it's it's meant to be informative, but it's also meant to be like entertaining. So there's generally like a lot of comedy involved in a lot of these. Yeah. But yeah. Okay. Thank you for explaining that because I was like, yeah. I was utterly like I just don't I know. know what this oh God, is no! I know concept. it's like an extremely fucking online thing. That's not <laughs> like a thing to be embarrassed about not knowing. Uh, sort of like the gold standard, who sort of reinvented it the last decade or so, is like Lindsay Ellis. Mm-hmm. Really changed a lot of that because it used to be like very bit heavy, extremely bit heavy. Yeah. Well, I. The, the thing was, uh, like, talking about movies on the internet in a video format used to, like, just be exclusively comedy, and then, like, slowly yeah. it evolved into, like, video essays that are actually, like, about something and not yeah. just, like, a People vehicle for People with film jokes. education, yeah. yeah, doing real breakdowns. Yeah. Now, some of my favorite are, um, oh, shit, I just totally forgot her name. Sarah, help. Uh, you're gonna... <laughs> uh, help. The... the, the <laughs> Ellis collaborator who made the uh, two-hour uh, uh, episode. Oh, Jenny of- Nicholson. Jenny Nicholson. Thank you. She's great. You said uh, two-hour, and I was like, yes, two-hour vampire diaries video. I know exactly. Yes. You, so, two, you two would be like not beatable in Pictionary. You'd be like, yeah, 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 yeah. No, that. that's just, yeah. <laughs> so is she, is uh, Jenny Nicholson, I know Lindsay Ellis has just like fucking left the internet. Is Jenny Nicholson yeah. still yeah. on there? Is she still oh, yeah. Jenny, yeah. Jenny Nicholson is still around. I really like um Sarah Zed. Sarah oh, Zed yeah. does like really well researched ones um about like, like very like it's like personally uh good for me because it's like weird like Tumblr shit that I remember uh, experiencing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, she does really, really in-depth research on um very inconsequential things. It's very yeah. uh it's that's very our shit. Yeah, no, that's yeah. Like a lot of stuff like 
If you have not ever heard about the John Locke conspiracy, I think that would be a very interesting one to start with. From Lost? No, 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 no. no. Sherlock. You are not prepared for this. All right, wait, wait. So go back to like, so what I'm looking at John Locke. Uh, It's J-O-H-N-L-O-C-K, all one word. Um. I don't know what the actual title of the video is, but if you do John Locke Conspiracy, uh, Sarah Z, she pronounces it Z because she's Canadian, but it's a Z. That's it for Season 5, Episode 17 of the Gateway Geeks podcast, Rape Revenge Films, A Discussion. If, after listening, you find yourself feeling distressed, please call the sexual violence professionals at the RAIN hotline. They can be reached 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, at 1-800-656-4673. Thanks for listening. This episode with Sarah Jane Connor, Tracy Gomillion, Chris Knetzer, and Joe Colburn. Editor, Joe Colburn. Producers, Tracy Gomillion and Joe Colburn. <laughs>